Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another ARMA induced seismicity webinar. Uh, uh, this is Mahdi Hattad at the Bureau of Economic Geology. Uh, we, we are hosting this webinar series with Sean Maxwell and, at, at uh, Oventiv and Jens Lundsny in, in the, at the USGS. Uh, today we have uh, this honor to uh, have Andy Barber from the US Geological Survey to present to us about hydromechanical anisotropy of the Arbuckle Wastewater Disposal Reservoir in Oklahoma. The list of the upcoming webinars is this in, in this slide. Uh, in September 10th, we will have Rebecca Salvage from the University of Calgary to present about the influence of a transitional stress regime on the source characteristics of induced seismicity and fault activation in Northeast British Columbia. And then in October 15th, we will have Alexandra Savedis uh, from the Bureau of Economic Geology. The topic will be determined and then in November 5th, we will have Cheryl Williams Stroud uh, from Illinois State Geological Survey. And the topic will be determined as well. Uh, for those of you who uh, are the first time to join us for this webinar series, we have some general rules for better flow of this webinar <clears throat> through the presentation and question and answer. Uh, first, feel free to share the webinar invites. Uh, interested parties should contact the committee to be added to the distribution list for future webinars, uh, as well as in order to be uh, eliminated from the list if you are not interested anymore. And uh, also everyone will be muted during the talk uh, in order for better quality of the voice. Please submit your questions during or after the talk in the chat button at the bottom of the Zoom meeting window. Please send these questions to everyone in order for us to summarize the repetitive questions. This Zoom meeting will be recorded, but uh, the release to the public uh, is upon authorization by the presenter's organization. Uh, and the previous recordings have been uploaded uh, uh, to our uh, Indus Seismicity Technical Committee YouTube channel and link is in the invitation email please subscribe to this channel to receive notifications for the future uploads. Uh, without further delay, uh, let's invite uh, Andy Barber to take the stage. Okay, thank you so much. I, I'm uh, really honored to be talking to everyone uh, today. Let's see. Oh, not my screen. I want to share my desktop or PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, well, um, like Madi said, I'm going to talk about um, some observations of anisotropy in the Arbuckle Reservoir. And uh, there we go. I think this this figure has probably come up at, all, at almost every talk, I'm sure, about Oklahoma, but it's just a, an overview of the seismicity rates over time. And, you know, we saw this big spike in, the, in 2015 and some of the largest injection-induced earthquakes on record in 2016. And, and since then, the, um, you know, there's been a really uh, pronounced tail off in the seismicity rates. And um, a lot of that is related to sort of um, statewide reductions and mitigation efforts that are meant to uh, reduce the, the overall volumes that are injected into the Arbuckle. And this figure on the right is just showing you the relative change from one year to the next, from 2016 to 2017, in terms of uh, the amount of injection per, per um, unit area in this little in this map here. And so that's motivated the, um, the potential for including uh, injection data into these short-term forecasts, for example, that the USGS has produced a couple of times now. Um, so the idea is, is maybe we can use injection to actually 
in form from a physics-based perspective, um, sort of short-term changes in hazard. Um, there seems to be effectively two ways to do this at this point. Um, obviously we need accurate forecasts of seismicity rates. If we're gonna calculate ground motion exceedances, the, the type of thing that gets you to hazard. Um, and the question really is, can we, can we calculate future induced seismicity rates from the present injection field? And um, like I said, there's, there's the rate and state friction approach, there's the seismogenic approach. And if I'm forgetting one, please feel free to, to, to remind me, but these seem to be in large part the, the main approaches so far. And here's, here are two examples of those. On the left is from um, Jack and Justin, um, who published in 2018, just using the rate and state equation that Siegel and Liu um, published in 2015, kind of applied that statewide and looked at how that might be useful for, for relating injection to seismicity rates. And then Cornelius and Matt and Mark did, did this nice paper in 2019 using um, the seismogenic approach and uh, you know, with a similar goal of relating uh, injection again to seismicity rates. And so it's not, to me, it's not exactly clear uh, which approach is beneficial and I'm not here to argue for one or the other, but um, you know, we, we do have to take the extra step to go from the actual modeled seismicity rates. So on the left would be the number of earthquakes um, per unit area. And you know, we have to convert that to, to hazard. So we have to, the seismicity rates are really important in terms of um, getting an accurate assessment of what the, the actual ground motion exceedances are gonna be. I should say this was uh, just published by um, Justin and SRL this year. And, uh, you know, to, to do that from a physics-based perspective, we want to try and um, say something about stress and pore pressure changes from injection in a way that's sort of tractable numerically. And to do that, we usually make some assumptions about the subsurface, like in Oklahoma, for example, you would assume that the, the layers are sort of flat and extensive in the, in the horizontal direction, that they um, show transverse isotropy so that there are, light, there are different parameters per layer, but um, not in, for example, the horizontal direction. And within each, in each layer, you might assume uh, some set of elastic parameters or hydro hydrologic parameters rather than specifying, for example, a permeability tensor, you just choose a value of permeability. And then usually that comes along with, you know, some, some assumptions about the flow regime. So whether it's radial flow, that's usually the common assumption. And these are built into codes like mod flow, um, POL, which is the code that I've used and others. So, uh, this is this is kind of a, a fundamental aspect of relating injection to stress changes in the or Coulomb failure stresses, I should say, in the in, at seismogenic depths. And I'm certainly, you know, I'm I'm guilty of this too. This was a study uh, in 2017 that we did on the Pawnee earthquake, and on the left is just the general model setup. So we just assume that the Earth was this nice layered structure. And uh, we looked at how changes in injection affected uh, Coulomb failure stresses leading up to the Pawnee earthquake. And then use those results to inform uh, uh, seismicity leaving, leading up to that earthquake. And this, you know, I think these are fairly decent results, but again, we, we are making these very, um, is simplifying assumptions to, to try and get, uh, uh, you know, to, to use sort of relatively limited data on the subsurface and the injection field. So uh, today I'm, I'm hopeful that I can show you that the poroelastic response of the R-buckle is 
is not always isotropic. And to do that, we're gonna use data from these direct measurements of pore pressure that we've been making and strain nearby. Um, and we use signals from long wavelength surface waves in particular from uh, large distant earthquakes or teleseisms. And we wanna uh, try and you know, quantify the degree of shear strain coupling in, in an undrained state. And, and so the teleseismic waves offer us a chance to do that, or at least approximately get to the undrained state. Um, these are, you know, in general, using um, water level measurements or pore pressure measurements to uh, identify shear strain coupling in a poroelastic medium is relatively new. I mean, this was first observed um, just over a decade ago. Um, and since then, there have been a few studies, but it's pretty rare to have co-located or even nearby strain measurements. And so we're, we're pretty fortunate here. And just a quick overview of the pore pressure measurements. I've, I've talked about this stuff before, but um, again, the, in 2017, we set up um, an observatory at an unused, but mechanically sound uh, Arbuckle injection well in Osage County. And uh, we, uh, at the site, we put a pore pressure sensor, obviously, uh, we, we buried a, a broadband seismometer, and we also buried a strong motion accelerometer. And so this is just a picture showing the wellhead on the bottom and sort of what the, the finished product looks like at the top. And um, the general completion diagram is just showing that uh, the well is, uh, you know, it used to be an injection well, so the goal is to inject directly into the Arbuckle group, which means that it's effectively isolated from all of the overlying units. So it's a direct measure of pressure in the, in the Arbuckle. This is what data from the first two years looks like. Um, in particular, these are relative changes in effectively the level that we started monitoring at. And so if, if the data points just go to the right, there's just sort of constant pressure in the reservoir. But if they start trending upwards, that's indicative of increasing pressure in the reservoir. And so we saw sort of distinct trends. There was a pretty pretty sharp, uh, sharply increasing period in uh, April of 2018 to December 2018. But the, that's, uh, the, the average for the full series is slightly lower at about five kilopascals per year. And uh, we can sort of look retrospectively or we can at least attempt to compare those to uh, what was observed very early on, uh, well before wastewater disposal was occurring. Um, and so this is a collection, these little, little points on the left are a collection of drill stem tests that were performed in the 50s through the 70s. And there's some scatter there and you can see where they're located on the map. Um, so we don't, have, we don't have great coverage, but um, at, at the very least, we think that, that there's a distinct difference between the pressure in the arbuckle now and the pressure that you might call uh, in its natural state, which is um, and all, at all points in time, it's been subhydrostatic, but it, it's going towards hydrostatic pressure. Uh, and then on the right, that's the, these black dots are the KGS well, um, just to the north of, of this map. And so there were successive measurements made um, very early on in the induced seismicity days. And then uh, I think this, this one is in 2016, and these roughly coincide with the measurements that we've been making. And then, like I said, it's, it's been subhydrostatic since for as long as we've known about, but um, with the overall increase in pressure that's trending towards a, a, a hydrostatic gradient. So these are the drill stem tests and uh, as a function of depth. 
And then just a word about the, the strain meter that we're using. Um, you can see on the map on the upper left that this uh, particular strain meter is about 40, 45 kilometers away from the actual monitoring well. And this is a Gladwin style differential capacitance system. So there are four gauges that are oriented precisely and you can combine those signals to give the horizontal strain tensor. And those are um, sampled up to 20 Hertz. So we can use them at, in the seismic band. And this is just a screenshot from a presentation from Larry Murdoch. Uh, these, these streamers are actually set up at a, uh, basically an analog CO2 injection site in Osage County. And the, the goal of those strain meters were to measure signals related to injection to help geomechanical modeling and, and so forth. So we're, we're effectively repurposing them for, for a, uh, this study. And let's see, sorry. so <clears throat> like I said, we're using teleseisms in the, this is an example of the Arbuckle actually responding to surface waves from distant earthquakes. And so this um, azimuthal map is showing the location of the 2017 magnitude 8.2 in Mexico uh, and, and sh showing the direction that waves generally were traveling towards the well. And then there's a zoom in showing the well and uh, some local faults and the strain meter. And um, on the bottom right, there's the time series that are associated with this earthquake. There's the water levels uh, in the in the Arbuckle. You can see kind of a smoother trend here. Um, we also have ground motions at the wellhead, like I mentioned from the broadband seismometer. So this, these have been rotated into the radial transverse direction. So T stands for transverse and R for radial. And then we also have uh, vertical, obviously. And these are the strain components from the, the borehole strain measurements. That's uh, like I said, about 40, 40 kilometers away. Um, so these also have been rotated. The tensor has been rotated into the same radial transverse coordinate system. So this RT, ERT is, um, is shear strain in that system. And then RR is radial, TT is transverse or hoop strain. And then the sum of those two is the aerial strain, which is a, a volumetric measure. So in this example, I mean, there's obviously a very close correspondence between strain and ground motions. And and that's good. It indicates that it's a relatively planar wave field. Uh, but this type of polarization, which I would say is pretty good, um, it's not always this good. And in fact, there are a lot of examples where the, the wave field uh, is not well polarized. And, th and that can happen for a number of reasons, like crustal multipathing and you know, the direction of propagation, along, whether it's along an oceanic plate or if it's along a plate boundary, all sorts of issues. Um, so we prefer to use the actual strain measurements rather than infer them from a seismometer. Because you're, when you're inferring strain from a seismometer, you're making assumptions about the wave field. We know that there's scaling of the uh, teleseismic response, the dynamic response in particular. So this just that same earthquake um, compared to uh, maybe it's its little brother, the 7.1. Uh, I, I forget when they occurred relative to each other, but um, you can clearly see that around uh, for about the same epicentral distance, the magnitude really, really matters in terms of generating dynamic strains, the type of dynamic strains that change pressure in the arbuckle. So uh, another reason for uh, using teleseisms is that it gives you a chance to test for azimuthal variations rather than using something like the tides or atmospheric pressure that's sort of ubiquitous everywhere, but doesn't change in, in you know, it's always gonna be the same source. Um, 
when we look at a broader collection of those dynamic responses, they all seem to um, follow the same trend. So what I mean is that the, the magnitude distance scaling of the arbuckle pressure changes uh, follow the same type of trend that, you, that we see in natural settings. Uh, these squares are from Japan and the, the X's are from California. And um, the, the black dots are from the present study and in the arbuckle and the open circles are from a previous study. Um, and we can also use this to start to say something about pore pressure changes associated with what have been thought to be significant triggering events of uh, dynamic triggering of earthquakes. So that include the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and the Mali earthquake. And if you look at the scale here, uh, you know, we're talking about for Tohoku, that would suggest about maybe up to five kilopascals of dynamic pressure change. So this, this effectively is about one or two orders of magnitude smaller than the type of dynamic stresses associated with those, uh, the actual seismic waves themselves. So we can, you know, in, in different studies, you could think about looking at what the triggering mechanisms are. Um, the second major observation is that the, we see static pressure changes, and these are these are effectively uh, in in this entire data set. There is a static change in every single record, um, and that is rather surprising to me because these types of shifts are almost uh, rare, rarely if ever observed, and and this is an example from the the 2017 Mexico earthquake, you can see the tidal trend is kind of this nice, smooth, smoothly varying trend. And then there's the seismic waves and then the low pass filtered version reveals this stat static response pretty quickly. It's surprising because there, you effectively, there's no effect from the static deformation associated with uh, the rupture. So this is, entirely related to some local process and the interaction with seismic waves. And unlike the dynamic response, we don't see any dependence on seismic energy density. So in particular, that magnitude distance model that I showed a few slides back, we see both positive and negative shifts. So the, the last, this example I just showed was a positive shift. So the pressure increased in the arbuckle, but we also see um, decreases that are, uh, that are uh, permanent in the arbuckle. So, uh, sorry. So this is effectively the, relative to the seismic energy density, this is a, indistinguishable from a random process with the present data, of course. And, so that suggests a, a local reservoir-based effect. So we're gonna, the goal is to, to try and estimate what the shear strain coupling is here. And so we're fitting the pore pressure data with the strain data. So we're, to do that, we're assuming this model that relates pore fluid pressure changes to um, uh, mean stress and differential stress. So this is, uh, the undrained poroelastic response. And typically um, for a linear isotropic medium, you set the Skempton's A value to one over three, and that cancels out the shear contribution. And you generally think of that response as only being related to the volumetric strain or stress that's occurring. Um, but we'll keep it general and we'll, we're gonna fit uh, both the volumetric and um, shear strain components that we measure at the strain meter and invert for these different parameters that I've listed here on the right so that, um, that the Skimpton's coefficients are there, the undrained bulk modulus. Um, this N term is, is generally expressed as a function of the elastic shear modulus and the Again, both Skimpton's terms. So we're solving for all these parameters. 
And this is an example of what happens when you fit pore pressure data to strain data. Uh, this was again for the same Mexico earthquake. The red line is, is the model prediction based uh, completely on the strain observations uh, using the inverted coefficients that we, we were solving for. So you can see um, pretty good agreement uh, sort of on multiple frequency scales. Um, you can kind of see the early arrivals show up really nicely and uh, the Rayleigh waves show up really nicely and, and so forth. I mean, there's some disagreement, uh, of course, but overall it's quite a strong, um, strong result. And this suggests a coupling ratio between 0. about 0. Uh, 0.4, which means the ratio of shear to aerial uh, coupling is, is obviously more dominant in the aerial component, but there is a significant component of shear strain coupling. And this, again, there's, you can kind of faintly see that this step change is about 160 plus or minus 10 Pascals. And this is what the entire collection looks like. So this is all, all of the results that we have. And again, the red is the model pressure based on the strain observations and the black are the, the observed water levels. So there's sort of, um, to me, I, I see multiple types of results here, sort of A, B, and C in this diagram. Um, the start with the, the group in B, these are ones where almost the entire record is really well fit by the strain observations. And then in the A group, um, for the most part, the, the Rayleigh wave contribution is pretty significantly uh, captured by the strain observations, but there seems to be some early time deviation around the, when the love wave comes in. And, and then there's the group in C where they're sort of a relatively poor fit. I mean, there's this suggestion that we're capturing the dynamics in the R buckle, but um, it definitely suggests that there's something else going on that's affecting R buckle pressure locally. So the third observation is the significant anisotropy in the Arbuckle. And so I showed you those fits, uh, but all of them have what you might call statistically significant, but it's clear that um, the strain coupling includes a, com a contribution from aerial, aerial strain, obviously, but also to shear strain. And so this diagram is just showing you the, uh, there's a trade-off. You, you have to know something about the rock. And so we, we, we are assuming that the undrained Poisson's ratio in the rock is, excuse me, lies somewhere between this range. And this is an experimentally determined range for uh, sandstone from De Tourney and Chang, 1993. Uh, and these lines, these contour lines are showing you the, the ratio, the, the values that you would expect for a given coupling ratio. So the blue lines are you know, the individual fits. And then when you invert everything, so every single record together to get sort of a single collection of parameters, uh, that's what this thick um, orange-ish line is showing you. So it's about 0.4. 0.41, something like that. And within this plausible, I would say plausible range of uh, under in Poisson's ratio, you get a, a Skempton's A value of about 0.24. And for reference, like I said, if, if you set A to one over three, um, that's the isotropic uh, expectation. So it's clearly uh, behaving anisotropic in an anisotropic way. And the ratio is consistent with previous measurements of uh, this uh, Wong 1997 paper was looking at um, limestone and then Lochner and Stanchitz in 2002, they did laboratory studies of the stress dependence in Berea sandstone. So, um, 
so that's uh, so that's good to see that there is some consistency with prior laboratory-based results. The fourth observation is that the strength of this anisotropy varies azimuthally. And so shown below are these coupling coefficients as a function of the back azimuth. And just a quick review, the back azimuth is just the angle from, from north between the station and the, the wave front. So, uh, and these arrows are just sort of visually the, the kind of general arrival directions. And for reference, I'm just showing some sort of tectonic indicators. So there's SH max. Now let's see if I have, yeah, I'll just go, go through those individually. Um, so that, so the, the brown regions are showing you the, the regions where um, we think arbuckle and intersecting faults and fractures sort of lie in terms of their orientation. And it's a nice study from uh, Fola in 2019, looking at, they compiled everything they could find and, and found some seismic data and interpreted the, um, those volumes and identified faults that were breaching the Arbuckle. Uh, and so we, we obviously, this data set doesn't have great azimuthal coverage, but there's definitely uh, a suggestion of an azimuthal response here. And then the SH max is, are from um, studies out of the Scan uh, Stanford group, so um, which have shown that there's relatively smooth variations in the stress field. Um, and it's sort of overall um, relatively narrow in terms of the distribution of values, something like 85 degrees from, from north. And, and then correspondingly, the SH min direction is just orthogonal to that. And then in comparison, the static shifts also show azimuthal variability. And it seems that, I'll get to that in a second, but it seems that the, the coupling ratios are strongest when the waves arrive between the SH min axis and the, uh, the fault and fracture orientations observed independently. So that's sort of in this direction shown by the, the arrows on this um, polar diagram. And then we see very clearly that the static shift, um, in particular, the value for the measurement in the direction of SH min is, is clearly the largest value in the collection. And so um, there seems to be a correspondence between that size of the shift and the direction of the principal stress axes. Um, I mentioned that the static shift observation is, is quite rare, actually. And uh, as such, we have a very limited understanding of, of what's causing these signals. The kind of first, I guess, plausible model was put forth by Brodsky in 2003. And the suggestion was that fractures that were prior to the seismic wave blocked uh, become suddenly unclogged. And, as a result, permeability increases and pressure changes. But uh, this model really can't explain pressure increases. It really can only explain pressure drops. So I don't think that holds here. Uh, there's another one that, as far as I know, um, it has some merit, but I think there are some, some, some serious issues with it in this context. And the idea is that with cyclic straining, you, you for, sort of accumulate damage uh, by dilatancy or compaction. And this is an idea that was first suggested for early observations of static response by roll-offs. Um, and then that really was sort of formulated specifically for rock damage accumulation by Shalev in 2016. And this, of course, can express 
or explain pressure increases and decreases, but it requires irreversible or inelastic rock damage. And so the question for me is what, when would the strain rates be high enough for that to occur? I'm not sure it would uh, maybe when it was tectonically active, I suppose um, it could be a result of local induced earthquakes. Um, if the observation point is close enough to the to the earthquake for um, you know, dynamic ruptures to actually breach the reservoir to cause um, maybe in a, a fault damage zone or something like that. But um, really this observation point is in a seismically inactive part of Oklahoma. So that seems somewhat implausible. Um, and also, you know, in damaged rock, the permeability would be really high. And in that case, it's it's difficult to sustain seismic pressure changes because the it's just uh, it's easier for fluid pressures to redistribute themselves under some loading source. So uh, the point is, <laughs> I don't know what the mechanism for the static response is, and I certainly welcome any thoughts anyone has, but um, that's a major unknown right now. I think. It might be a little more straightforward with the mechanism for the azimuthal variations is, um, I think it comes down to a few sort of fundamental points that we know it's been well understood for a long time that fracture networks modify the elasticity in the rock. And so you can create um, additional anisotropy in the material beyond what it normally would have under loading conditions. We would expect that the reservoir is nearly saturated in fluid, or if not 100% saturated, and that fractures are fluid filled. Um, you would also expect, just based on the critically stressed crust hypothesis, which is very well observed at this point, that within that fracture network, um, only critically stressed fractures are hydraulically conductive, otherwise they would be confined. And so depending on whether the waves modulate confined or fluid filled interconnected fractures would, would change how, what the sensitivity to um, seismic waves would be because the, the relative ratio of the compliance in the, in the fracture normal direction relative to its um, sort of tangential direction uh, changes pretty dramatically. So in the, in the filled but confined case in the center, um, that ratio goes towards zero, which means that the, the material stiffens in the normal direction. And then in the fluid filled but interconnected case, it's more temperature dependent and relates to rock and fracture conductivity, fluid viscosity, that sort of thing. And I, I guess we can try and look for supporting evidence from shear wave splitting. Um, shear wave splitting has for a long time you know, been, the, been a, an important tool for looking at anisotropy in the crust, seismic anisotropy. Um, and it's obviously, like I just said, well known that the compliance tensor going away from anisotropy towards um, strongly anisotropic that can manifest in seismic observations and creates um, polarizations. The, the structure of the rock creates polarizations that could be measured. And, um, but also that fractures and fluids can have a, an additional effect on the type of splitting that you see. And this was an example from Burden and Wussfeld 2013, just, just showing some examples of what the anisotropy looks like um, on the bottom for um, drain conditions and on the top when there's sort of undrained or um, confined fractures in, in this very simple example. So it's on the, you know, it's a relatively small and it's a, uh, you know, effect in the seismic velocities, but you can definitely measure it. And it's been measured in Oklahoma. Uh, this is like, uh, as far as I understand, one of the first observations of splitting in Oklahoma from Queen and Riser. 
Um, this was actually made very close to where the, the Arbuckle well that I've been talking about, um, where that sits. Uh, and um, they also looked at, uh, did some fracture mapping. So that's what's showing on the top right. It's just the distribution of fractures that they mapped, at least in this particular area. And then on the bottom is the, the fast axes. So the, the sort of direction of polarization induced by the anisotropy. And this for a long time is thought to be indicative of the state of stress in the crust or even upper mantle. Um, and so, so for, for comparison, that's the direction of SH max um, measured recently by focal mechanism inversions and borehole stress studies. And measurements continue to this day. And we see also um, we can measure splitting related to induced sequences. This is Elizabeth Cochran's paper from 2019, looking at the Prague sequence. Uh, there is some variability in these splitting measurements. Again, this is these um, Polar histograms are showing you the, the distribution of fast axes that they've measured. And again, it kind of the general collection agrees very well with the state of stress that's been measured. And most recently, Rob and Elizabeth looked at the temporal changes or lack thereof in um, these fast axes with respect to earthquake rates and um, disposal volumes. I think they pretty clearly show that there's not much evidence for a systematic temporal variation that was suggested in 2017. But nonetheless, there's a very clear seismic anisotropy. And it, and it has some variability, like I said, but it is relatively uniform. Um, it could, there could also be you know, some, some relationship between the anisotropy that we observe and differential stress. So that just in particular, you know, that's just the difference between the maximum and minimum uh, stresses. This can be measured in the laboratory for the triaxial setup as was done in the 2002 paper from Dave Lochner. Uh, they actually explicitly measured the Skimpton's coefficients as a function of, of differential stress. And this was their control sample. So basically overall, all of the differential stresses met, uh, you know, tested. They see no, no stress dependence in this control sample. But when you, when you look at reservoir materials, typical reservoir materials, you see pretty strong stress dependence, not necessarily in the, the B coefficient, which is the one generally we work with, but the, they use this, this term eta, which is just, I'll go back, it's just a reformulation of this term. So it has A and B in it. So the A term is definitely stress dependent, meaning the more, uh, as you go deeper in the, into the crust or you increase differential stress, the value of eta tends to decrease. They plotted this as negative eta. And so just lining up where the approximate differential stress in the Arbuckle is, assuming hydrostatic pore pressure, of course, we know that it's subhydrostatic, so it might be a little, it should be a little different than this. Um, this makes sense with what we're measuring in the, uh, from the seismic observations. And this obviously affects the patterns of earthquake stress transfer and pore pressure changes in the crust. And um, if there is significant shear coupling. So uh, Wang, Herb Wang did this nice study in 1997 looking at uh, documenting um, poroelastic anisotropy in limestone, found this value of about 0.2 which is again, consistent with the value we're measuring from the seismic observations and show that uh, basically was using, using that as a tool to reconcile some, disagree some major disagreements between dislocation models uh, used to try and understand water level measurements around the Parkfield area in California. 
showed pretty clearly that once you introduce an isotropy into that calculation, all of a sudden the observations make better sense. So the, and the arrows are just showing you the difference between or, or highlighting a particular observation point where the anisotropic case suddenly um, makes the agreement much better with, with the model. So uh, just to summarize, the, again, the observations that we have here is um, I showed you that the dynamic pressure scales with the source magnitude and the logarithm of the distance to the station. That's sort of generally expected. The static pressure shifts, these are, are in the Arbuckle, these are common observations. Otherwise, they're pretty rare um, globally. And those show no, no such scaling with um, source magnitude or distance. The Arbuckle, when we fit to um, strain data, shows significant anisotropic poroelastic behavior. And there is, uh, Coverage notwithstanding, there's some azimuthal dependence in the strength of the coupling and, and the static signals that we see. Um, this is by far not an exhaustive list of implications, but I just wanted to point out that I think what this means is that models of injection are probably incorrect in assuming that, isotro uh, that the layer properties are isotropic, at least in the Arbuckle or layers close to the Arbuckle. And I think this applies to static stress calculations too, um, the kind that would be used to um, you know, measure things like uh, earthquake to earthquake interaction, for example. So in that sense, Coulomb failure stress calculations should probably also account for shear coupling in the effective normal stress term. And that's, that can be important at low differential stresses, for example, here, um, you know, with the Arbuckle being one to two kilometers and seismicity being a few kilometers below that. <clears throat> um, so a question, that, and then the question is, what's the role of this shear coupling in dynamic earthquake triggering? Are there, does this have any influence on aftershock productivity? So, so all of these things relate to back to the original goal of getting a hazard from injection. Um, but I think the reason for all this is the fracture network is probably dominating the flow regime uh, over multiple scales. And I think by way of our understanding of how fractures transmit fluid pressures, I think this suggests a major role in the fracture network in, in actually transmitting um, stresses and pressure into the seismogenic crust. Um, you know, there's a, there's a serious um, there's serious amount of room for improvement though. I, at the observations I'm showing you here are from a single location. That's a I would be the first to admit that's a major limitation, and so we really need additional observatories around Oklahoma. Could be elsewhere. Um, but it'd be nice to have an observatory or, you know, a few other around the seismic, seismically active part of the, the state, uh, maybe in Kansas, uh, for example. You know, we, we need additional measurements to be able to firmly establish these links with induced seismicity to make more general statements about, about this phenomenon. Obviously, azimuthal data is is or the coverage in that sense is relatively limited. So, you know, as earthquakes occur globally, we'll continue to, to uh, you know, build this database. And, you know, there are ways to fill in the, the gaps, so to speak, and we can try and measure stress or um, uh, the distribution of faults and fractures in this particular area. We do injection tests to try and get at what the flow regime is locally. Um, and I, oh, I, I wish I had better answers for what the source of the anisotropy and the pressure shifts are, but I, I, I can't say for certain what they are. I don't think we have the right data sets to do that yet. 
Uh, there's, there's obviously some uncertainty about what the role of organic material or clays are. Um, the actual bedding structure, the down to the pore structure of the arbuckle, or whether there's some, some stress concentration created by layer contrasts. Um, and again, I think that's where additional monitoring and well testing can help. I just wanted to say that the, the, most of the work that I just showed you is in this new paper that we just published. Uh, it's open access. Um, I'm happy to send you a copy if, if you can't write the uh, link down quick enough. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about this paper and it's gonna be part of a, an ID seismicity special edition coming out soon. And then, so we published a couple other papers that, uh, you know, if you're if you're interested in learning more about the measurements we've made in Oklahoma, feel free to check those out. I'll send you a copy. I'm happy to send you a copy if you need. So uh, that's it. Yeah, let me go back. But um, thank you everybody for your attention, and I'm more than willing to answer any questions. Well, thank you, Andy, for a great talk there um, that I think addresses a lot of the, you know, very much active questions and gets really to the heart of questions about, you know, the role of poro elasticity versus fractures and ties those things together and highlights um, how much the geology and understanding the geology uh, matters. So um, yeah, please, please put your questions in the chat. Um, we already have some here. Uh, the first one is from um, Michael Blanpaid. The question, I think this refers to um, some of the slides you showed earlier about um, pore pressure uh, changes observed in that Arbuckle well. And he's wondering whether the static pore pressure offset, offsets that you discussed there. Um, yeah, and, and probably was it a slide before? There, there was a couple other slides around, you know, around this time that I think address some of the same points. Uh, whether the static pore pressure offsets that are observed, um, do they recover over time? And, um, you know, what is the time over which they occur that could offer insight into the mechanism of the offset? Yeah, uh, uh, great question. Um, these differ fundamentally from the type of offsets that were measured in Parkfield, for example, that show a very clear diffusion pattern, meaning that, you know, the pressure changes and then diffuses away. So there's some time scale of recovery. Um, they differ in the sense of they seem to be sudden and it's really hard to tell if they go away. And so that there doesn't seem to be an obvious recovery time scale, suggesting that it's not really, um, not really related to uh, this model of, for example, pressure diffusion associated with the sudden you know, slug of fluid. Um, so yeah, it's also really hard to tell because of the sensitivity to earth tides and because of that and the general sort of noise levels. Um, yeah. It's, it's really hard to tell. And I, so I don't, I don't actually know what the answer is, you know, quantitatively. I can say that it doesn't appear to be very significant in terms of recovery. Um, yeah. Michael, do you have anything more that you want to say on that? Uh, no, that was great. Thank you. There's another question by Sean Maxwell here um, that is referring to an early uh, slide with a map. Um, that seem to show this, this Arbuckle Observatory well close to a regional scale fault. And he's wondering whether the presence of that fault there could impact the observations, you know, particularly with regard to say the static uh, changes in pore pressure. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, to me, okay, so just for clarification, I think Sean, what you're talking about is this long line here on this fault here. Um, and that connects up to where the Pawnee rupture was. So uh, multiple people have told me that that's not a real fault, that it's um, maybe a vestige of an old study that never got removed from the OGS fault database. I, I can't say for sure if it actually exists. 
it exists in the fault database, but that doesn't mean it's actually real. Um, there is some evidence closer to the Pawnee rupture. I'll go back to Fola's paper. Uh, this doesn't show where, where this is collected, but there is some evidence of that, of a structure aligned along that direction intersecting with the R buckle. So if that fault does indeed exist, then absolutely it could impact the response. I think um, this is this is precisely where active well testing can get us some insight into how significant it's controlling the flow regime here. Um, but it's a it's a great question. I don't. I it, it it looks close on this map. It might be too far to actually have an influence on these direct measurements. Um, we tend to think of the you know. You can kind of relate the scale of the problem to the, the, the wavelength of the source signal. And you know, these are long, long wavelength seismic waves, but um, it generally gives us like a sort of a hundred meter, maybe kilometer type zone of influence that we're looking at. I would say a kilometer is probably a stretch, but. Um, are there image logs available for this Arbuckle well? You know, if they are, they're lost in the ether somewhere. Um, I, I wish we had a, you know, I, I wish we were the ones to have completed the well and, you know, do the drilling, do the logging, all that stuff. Um, but it, unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be available. And so I think that's a, that's a good point that, you know, future observation points should attempt to really characterize that particular location as, as well as possible, just to eliminate any sources of uncertainty, but also to give us some clues that, that you know what's going on locally. I have a thank you, and Sean, um, if you want to say anything else, jump in. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, Andy. Uh, I have a question of my own um, with you know comparing the pore pressure changes. Uh, or the water level changes you, that you see in the Arbuckle well, and whether those compare, um, you know, or whether whether you have compared those to the pore pressure evolution models that people have done for, you know, on regional, on state, you know, basically the scale of the state, you know, a number of these have been done, and whether the timing of pore pressure increases at this well seem to match the, you know, the rates that that the models would suggest, and so on. Yeah, I, I can say I haven't done that explicitly, but the folks like um, Jai and um, Shirzai who have really taken the, the modeling to a sophisticated state. And um, as far as I understand it, in the last sort of study they published in uh, related to relating, you know, injection in Oklahoma to seismicity, there was a an attempt and a successful one to, to match what the model observations or what the model predictions say the pressure change should be over time um, with, I'm not sure if they included this particular well, but I know that they they looked at the some of the, Kanja, the, the KGS wells uh, in terms of, you know, as a sort of a tie point or calibration to, um, what the you know the, the most appropriate parameters to set in their model should be, and as far as I remember, it was it worked pretty well in terms of explaining the pressure increase. Um, you know, there's there's time scales involved that are sometimes challenging to to model. You know, it gets pretty computationally demanding pretty quickly. So, you know, maybe maybe that comparison was a very simplified one, but I think it's really important that we try and use observations like this to calibrate models. Um, I think also, yeah, I think the work that Matt Weingarten did with Cornelius involved some calibration with, um, I'm, I'm struggling to remember the data set they were using, but the same sort of thing where they, uh, um, you know, they developed that hydrological model to explain seismicity, but did so in a way that explains 
um, independent observations like um, fluid pressure. Yeah, and if I remember that one right, and I could be getting some of this wrong, I know that one thing that they did was um, to try to calibrate the model based on the timing at which seismicity occurred. And that's how they calibrated some of the um, permeability for that. I don't, I don't remember whether they had access to other well data or not. Right. Well, there's a question from Bill Ellsworth here. Um, he's asking you know, about the basement specifically, since the seismicity is occurring almost exclusively in the basement, can you comment on what is known about the hydrologic conditions there, especially anisotropy? Yeah. Uh, trying to formulate, uh, I, I think, hopefully I understand this to mean not what the implications for, for anisotropy in the Arbuckle are, but how we might extend those lessons to greater depths. Um, I think what this means is that we should assume there is, especially because the, the seismicity is, you know, sort of within this range of, of significant stress-induced anisotropy. Um, you know, the, the deeper you go, the, you know, it starts to get a little more uh, homogeneous in a sense, but it, at least in the shallow crust, there should be and I think this confirms that, as well as the splitting measurements, that there is there should be significant seismic and likely um, hydrologic anisotropy. And so I don't I don't know if this is borne out in studies looking at you know the space time evolution of either aftershock sequences or just seismic swarms. If if that is you know, apparent in Oklahoma, you know, that could, maybe that explains some of the, some of the work like that Xiao Wei was sh showing a few years back in terms of multiple sort of temporal scales or, or um, temporal processes. Um, but I think, yeah, I'm, I'm going back to, I'll just go back to that slide. I'm going back to Wong's result. And, you know, these were the source of this model is a, is a buried dislocation at greater depths. And, and so, it, you know, if, especially if the anisotropy gets stronger as you get closer to the surface, you know, this is gonna be really important to consider um, you know what what that what the effects are uh, you know in general so uh, it's a good question i i kind of struggled through that but because i don't I don't really know but i uh, i think it's an important one to keep in mind okay thanks um so i've had a few questions are there additional questions Andy, i have a question <clears throat> yeah Regarding uh, Michael's question, uh, what I see for this uh, static core pressure offset is uh, there might be some dynamic change of the reservoir, like maybe uh, natural fracture dilation or a hydraulic fracture intersection with natural fracture that results in a channeling of uh, pore pressure from injection well to the fault, to, to, the, to the observation well, for example. So uh, do you think this is... Uh, what the, uh, that uh, what you you can just predict or uh, observe or uh, like if you have seen any micro seismic events you may be able to see this channeling um, uh, right and I I think that's a that's a great point and uh, as we've suggested in this paper that one way to perhaps test for the mechanism is is to actually get a close up view on micro seismicity at the time of you know, these, these static offsets. Obviously you can't predict when they're gonna happen. Um, and we haven't set up you know, a, a dense array or something like that, but um, that might be a case for deploying you know, a DAS string or something at these observation wells to, to potentially look at this in detail. So when uh, you know, I'd expect some degree of, um, tiny, you know, seismic ruptures to occur, 
under certain conditions. If, but if not, then that rules out uh, probably a number of mechanisms for this types of offsets. So I think it's, I think it's a really good point, and I, I wish we had um, you know better, uh, I guess high, high resolution seismic measurements from this region. I think would be really helpful. Thank you. It's after um, 11, and um, I guess we can officially conclude the, um, the talk now and, and probably continue uh, questions informally as people have those in a minute. But um, so in doing that, I'd like to thank you again, Andy. That was a fabulous talk. And obviously, there's a lot of interest in these parameters and these, you know, as, as I mentioned, this really gets to the heart of a lot of the active questions um, about induced seismicity in this area and elsewhere. So thanks again. Thank you guys, really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Andy. It was great talk. Okay, appreciate thank you. It. If, if someone has question in the informal part of the webinar, you can ask it uh, personally. That's the time to do that. Yeah, and I'm happy to stay on for, you know, however long people want. I have a, maybe a half an hour or so of time available. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Andy, as I was watching um, that uh, discussion about the uh, stress dependence, um, I wonder, you know, the stress dependence relates to which fractures are active, as you mentioned. It also relates to the stress anisotropy and um, this is an area over, I mean, over there, it's broadly strikes the faulting. So um, I wonder what, you know, what role that plays. You probably get a different uh, response if this was a little further north in Kansas, where it's, you know, there's both normal and strikes the faulting, maybe a little more normal faulting, and further south, where it's especially strikes the faulting active. Um, there's probably something there. What do you I think, think? Yeah, I totally agree. I think this all depends. I wouldn't say all depends, but a major component of this is what the state of stress is at that particular location. And um, I know it's really difficult to measure um, directly, especially, you know, relatively shallow depths, but, you know, even just the inferences from focal mechanism inversions is, is very helpful, uh, obviously. So, I haven't quite thought about what the, you know, if it would be stronger or weaker in terms of the anisotropy, if it'd be stronger or weaker, you know, in a normal faulting environment versus a reverse or strike slip. But yeah, I guess I could imagine, I can imagine at least that the diazimuthal sensitivity would be much different. Uh, Cause I think that the difference in state of stress implies that, that it, there's fundamentally different orientations to the fracture network and at least fractures that are, you know, transmitting fluid pressures. So yeah, if, you know, if any, if you or anyone have any thoughts on, on ways to test these kind of things, I'm more than open to ideas. So. Getting me thinking about this. Um, that was a really interesting question there. The problem with a finding like this is that all of a sudden I'm not going to be satisfied with the types of injection models that I used to do. And so that just increases my computational burden by order of magnitude. So um, actually, I want to show a slide here really quickly that relates to this um, anisotropy issue. If you will indulge me on this, let's see. So I don't know if you've seen this. Um, this relates to, oops. This relates to the stresses, you know, that the anisotropy is a function of the style of faulting. So, you know, if you just take the top case, which is more relevant here anyway, um, it, it's the stress magnitudes, principal stress magnitudes is a function of a phi or the style of faulting. So if you're in a more normal faulting stress state, the stresses are just, the stress magnitudes are just much closer to each other 
than say if you go to strike slip faulting, where it's, so the vertical stress is this dashed line here, and it's all normalized to the vertical stress. And in you know standard normal faulting, pure normal faulting, if you have zero point five, you have SH max here and SH min here. They're not far apart from each other, but then if you go to pure strike slip faulting, like you have in some parts of Oklahoma, they're quite a bit further apart from each other. So there's, you know, and that's on top of the issue with which fractures are active. Hmm. That's quite a, yeah, I actually don't recall seeing this figure before. This is interesting. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's in my dissertation and it's gonna come out in a paper that um, in AAPG, AAPG bulletin that we've been waiting for months and months and months to be finally, uh, so I guess published. just looking at that um, in comparison to those two figures, uh, I guess the under pressure effect would make that even more pronounced. Correct. Yeah, yeah that's right. Back to that. Yeah, the stress is, well, yeah, that's assuming that, you know, this is assuming that the crust is critically stressed. And so if it's, if the stresses have equilibrated in a, in a, um, in a low pore pressure, you know, sub hydrostatic environment over, you know, tectonic time frames, then yes, these would be a little further apart. Not a whole lot in, you know, because the under pressure is not that high in, in Oklahoma, but um, yeah, they, they would. But it requires, you know, that that they did equilibrate that way, and I guess they would have because um, th this, you know, at least these reservoirs are thought to have been under pressure, you know, well before. Yeah, I mean. Not, it's not a transient factor is what I'm saying. Right. It's a geologic yeah. factor, yeah. Well, I certainly would be, you know, maybe in one sense the test would be what would be the difference in behavior between, you know, like the Arbuckle started out under pressure and we've been filling it up. So what, what's the difference between the response at a, an under pressured state versus hydrostatic? That, that, could, that might be actually quite revealing. Yeah, and it would require, see, as the as it goes up to closer to hydrostatic, it would the crust would have to equilibrate, you know, the stresses would have to equilibrate, um, you know, in order for that to happen, or in, or, in order for, you know, um, the differential stresses to go down. But presumably that is to some, you know, I don't. That to, to presumably that is happening to some degree due to all those earthquakes and you know a seismic creep as well. I just don't know how much that's happened already and how much is going to be in the future. Right, right. I mean, I showed Rob Schumel's work about the splitting measurements over time, and they when they took a the reason for that study was the um, paper in two thousand and seventeen suggesting that the anisotropy was changing dramatically as the Arbuckle was filling up pressure-wise, but it turns out that that may have just been an artifact of the way that the splitting measurements were made in that 2017 paper. So they're, you know, I'm, in one sense, like I expect changes to be occurring, but they might be happening so slowly that it would take a while to, to actually see, in a sense, or measure those changes. And they'll probably be pretty small relative to the stresses already stored in the crust in general. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about, you know, these, you know, we're talking about the difference between like 0.45 megapascal under pressure to 0.46 or something like that. You know, it's like, it's measurable, yeah. but it's small on the, on the absolute sense. <laughs> Questions from other people, comments? I think we may be pretty much All at, right. the, at the end here, but oh, yeah, that's great. that's really good stuff, Andy. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that. But I appreciate the opportunity too. Like I said, it's, I think it's been a great seminar. I hope you guys continue for a while if it's not too much burden, so. <laughs> Looks like people are still interested, so um, probably we will be, yeah. Cool. Thanks everybody. Okay. Thank See you, you so much, Andy. Yeah, you're welcome. Great. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend. Thanks. Bye-bye.